what are the commonalities among leaders who sustain excellence over an extended period of time. Vanessa, welcome back to the Learning Leader Show. Welcome. Oh, thanks so much for having me. Charisma is kind of weird in that you kind of look at someone and say they've they've got it, and sometimes they don't. I specifically think my background's in sports, and as a quarterback, they say that certain guys have this kind of it quality, this it factor. I think of uh, I'm from Ohio, so I'm a big fan of Joe Burrow. He's a quarterback of the Bengals. He led them to the Super Bowl. Everyone's like, he's just got it. And they're not even sure what that means. So when you think of charisma or it, that it factor of a leader, what is that? How, how, how do you deconstruct that? Yes. So it's real. There is an it factor. You're not making that up. And the, the interesting thing about this, before I even define it, because we are going to define it, we're going to break it down to a formula. But before I even define it, I have some good news, which is it, it can be learned. Mm. And this is something that for me, I also recognized people who had that it factor. And I knew I did not have it. That was something I knew from a very, very young age. I'm a recovering awkward person. I could see these <laughs> very, very recovering. Oh. I could see these people who had it. And I thought, well, charisma is an eight trait. You're either born with it or you're not. So here's the good news is you absolutely can learn it. And there are, there is a section of, of the population that they are born with it. They kind of naturally have it. That's a very small percent, but most highly charismatic people have learned it and have cultivated it. So what is it? Researchers from Princeton University did a groundbreaking study where they found that when we are judging people, when we're making our impressions of others, it's actually only comes down to two traits, warmth and competence. Hmm. And the reason why these traits are more important than all other traits, these two traits make up 82% of our judgments of others. 82%. Now, that's incredible, right? When you think about meeting people, you're like, oh, I want them to be trustworthy and powerful and funny and attractive and smart. We, you know, we can make a list of, of 100, but actually it's these two that matter. Why? When we first meet someone, we are very quickly trying to answer two basic questions. Can I trust you? And can I rely on you? Because mm. as humans, those are the things that one, keep us safe. So trust, am I safe? Do you have good intentions? Second, can I rely on you? Are you going to give me good intel, good information that I can actually use to keep myself safe and safe and productive and happy? So warmth, people who are highly charismatic, they first, and it is actually chronological, they first signal high trust, high likability, high friendliness. And then very next, they signal high competence, high power, memorability, capability, efficiency. We love to be around people who are both warm and competent because they make us feel, huh, I can trust and rely on you, which we love. And that is that it factor. Wow. Okay. How do we learn to become warmer? And it sounds weird to even say this, but, but more competent about whatever yeah. it is that we're doing. How can we, how can we learn these two most important traits? It seems like in order to uh, have the it factor or have the charisma, which from a leadership perspective, I think if you're trying to gain followers or even help other people become leaders, you have to have it. So how do we do this? Okay. So first we have to talk about something very difficult and this is difficult, which is, can you fake warmth? Can you fake competence? Right? So Yes, you can fake it. And there are people, these are the con artists who learn the cues of warmth and competence and they fake it so they make it. The problem is that they can only get so far. So I try to be, this was my biggest worry with writing this book. And it actually gave me tremendous writer's block. Oh my gosh, the worst writer's block when I was in November of 2021 and I was in like the final draft. And my biggest concern was what if people use this for evil and not good? And so I am going to assume positive intention. I'm going to assume that people listening to this have genuine warmth and competence, that you know your stuff and that you have good intention because you can fake it to make it, but A, that's exhausting and it will only last so long. So if you have genuine warmth and competence and the most important 
um, way that I want to share this work is with people who have really good ideas, but don't know how to share them. That's the best way to think about this. So the way that we learn it is we master our cues. What this whole, my whole adventure started 17 years ago when I noticed that highly charismatic people, it didn't matter if they were politicians, businessmen, celebrities, female leaders, it didn't matter what industry they were from. They were all using this strikingly similar set of cues. And I remember 17 years ago, watching a TED talk. Actually, there was no TED talks back then. I think it was an Inc. interview and then a Larry King interview and then a People magazine interview and going, they all did the same thing. And that's when I started to code all of these cues. A cue is a social signal that we send to each other. And there are four different modes of communication for cues to make it easy for us to think about these. So the first one is nonverbal. Our body language, our gestures, our facial expressions, our posture, even how we move through the world, nonverbal. Second is verbal, the words we use, and also our syntax, how we use our words. Third is vocal, and this is the one that I think is most often forgotten. So that's our volume, our pace, our cadence, our syntax, our accent. All of those things are the, the vocal aspect. And the last one, the smallest, is imagery. That's um, the colors we wear, the ornaments we wear, our accessories, even the props behind us, what are, what's in our Zoom backgrounds, what we're holding in a profile picture, um, the kinds of clothes we wear. So those four modes of cues are how we diagnose or very quickly assess someone's warmth and competence. Mm. So I w- let's, let's pause for a second and get personal. When you see my background that I'm highlighting my two books and a bunch of other books and a globe and some other things, uh, a helmet I got from a company that is speed, like what, what, what was your initial, like, uh, the blink like Malcolm Gladwell yeah. reaction when you, when we first connected on zoom. Absolutely. High competence. So first a lot of books and specifically framed books. So that shoots up your competence cues right off the bat. I noticed a couple of other specific props, which are also a little bit more high in the competence range, good lighting, but overall high competence, right? So there's nothing that I immediately can grasp in your background that I'm like, Oh, relatability. And that's something for you to keep in mind um, is, is there something that you can put in your background that will make people be like, oh, me too. Now, most mm-hmm. people don't have a book, right? So they, they think, oh, that's impressive. This is, this is the balance. Here's the, we're getting down into it, which I'm so glad you asked this question is competence without warmth leaves people feeling suspicious. Uh-huh. This is directly from the research. So Dr. Susan Fisk, she identified what happens with very smart, impressive people is they come at you with all their smarts, right? They have their accolades and their degrees and their successes and their accomplishments. And the more successful someone gets, sometimes the less relatable they become. And that's why you have very smart people who they hear, oh, I'm intimidated by that person or that person is cold or I don't know, I just can't read her. It's because what's happening is they're sending so many competence cues that I feel a distance. Now, I I know you a little bit, right? We've had interaction together. So I already have relatability with you. But if someone were to just pop on video and see your background, I think they might get lots of competence. They would know you were smart and very capable. Look how many books you've read. Look how many books you've written. But they might wonder, "Mm, can I trust him? Now, I do like the rubber, the yellow rubber duckies, but I can't read it. What is it? That's a Seth Godin book. Oh my goodness. He, okay, he took so, 100, printed a hundred of those huge thick ones. Yeah. This might work. Okay, as so well. yeah. That That's a little bit of a warmth cue because it's like a, it's a rubber ducky, but I yeah. would think about what warmth cues upon first impression, could you immediately add to your background? Now today I'm all white, right? Which means it sort of like leaves me neutral a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I knew that my imagery today is super bland. And the reason for that kind of a, a funny in, inside story is um, at, later today, I'm teaching a class at Harvard. I thought, Ooh, what do I want my cues to be in my impression at Harvard? And I thought, I want to go mute so I can let my content speak for itself. So I have a white background. I have a very boring navy blue V-neck shirt on, almost no jewelry and very, um, you know, simple makeup. I did that on purpose. I wanted to let my content speak for myself. So all these cues, they add up to how people treat you. 
Wow. I think that the cues you send to others, tell them how they should treat you. Your background tells me I should treat you with high competence and respect. I'm probably not going to do much chit chat with you right off the bat because I see all those competence cues. Huh? Got you. You're making me in my head spinning, which is great. That's why I love these hey. conversations that make me think <laughs> about this. Um, does this get exhausting for you to think about like how you're show because now you're, you've written multiple best-selling books on, yeah. you know, body language and, and how to captivate people and cues. I, I could imagine, is it a lot of pressure? I mean, you have to feel like, oh my God, they're going to be judging how I look, the way I shake my, shake hands, the way I walk into the room, the way I touch my face. I mean, like everything <laughs> is, is, does that get kind of, uh, potentially exhausting for you? So confession is it's actually easier. And I know that sounds crazy, oh. but as a neurotic, awkward person, <laughs> <laughs> getting to know me real well, as a neurotic, awkward person, actually, it makes me feel like I can be myself. Oh. And I know that's crazy, but I don't process social information like most people do. So I, I'm not very good at reading people naturally. I'm, I'm not naturally charismatic. And so for many years, I was hiding my awkwardness, right? So I was hiding the fact that I didn't understand, I couldn't process social information very well. And also I was hiding the fact that I had to create a system for interacting with people. That's the only way I know how. So I know that in the first few seconds of a video, I should smile. I should wave hello. I should use an up tone of voice and an up facial expression and use a positive greeting. That formula makes me feel so calm oh. because what happened before is I didn't know what to do. So I would hop on a video and I'd be like, oh, can you, I don't know, am I here? Like, I would be so awkward because I didn't have this formula. So in a weird way, one, it makes me feel more calm that I know what to do. I have a blueprint for all of my interactions. And second, I kind of like being so transparent saying I'm in this boring blue shirt because I want you to focus on my content. I, I hold up my hand like this and I wave hello at the beginning of a video call because I want you to know that I'm trustworthy and I have good intentions. Hmm. So I, I almost feel like for, and, and captivate my first book, the opening line of that book was I'm a recovering awkward person because I just wanted to get it out with cues. It was like this giant sense of relief to tell people, Hey, this is how I socially survive. You've asked me over years, you know, how, how did you get the book dealer? How do you make it on stage? And I'd be like, um, I have a blueprint of how I work the room and formulas. For, and people would be like, what? And now I can just give it to people. And it's like, we're, we're all speaking the same language. And I think for, for folks who are listening, if you've ever felt, um, overestimated, uh, sorry, underestimated and you wish you were overestimated. People don't um, give you enough credit for the ideas you have. If you ever feel like you cannot get on the same page with people, if you wish that you had a shared value system with the people in your life, I think cues is sort of a secret way to go about it. Hmm. These days, it's really hard to talk about values in terms of what do you believe? What do I believe? You know, that's a really big discussion, but saying Hey, I want to make sure that everyone who I work with and everyone I'm friends with trusts me and knows that I have good intention. And I want to share my ideas in a way that makes them super digestible. Here's how I want to do it. I'm going to use this cue and this cue and this cue. So do you feel like though, for the person who isn't naturally good at this, because some of the people just naturally seem to like, I don't know if yes. like, remember, there's all these stories about Bill Clinton, how he made you feel like you're the only person in the room, even though he's the most powerful person in the world at those times and the way he look in your eyes. And I'm sure his cues yeah. are amazing. But, but when you say the word formula, mm -hmm. some might perceive that is, is she being authentic? Is she being mm -hmm. real? If she's got to follow a specific formula for how to start a zoom call, is this authentically her? Like, what is Vanessa like when She's lounging on the couch with her family, watching Netflix, just chilling. Like, is it, is it, is it a different person? Like, how do I know I'm authentically getting Vanessa when she's got this formula to show up for a meeting, a zoom call, whatever it may be. Remember it's super authentic if you have good intention and this is our assumption, right? So like yeah. my, my intention for this entire hour is deliver amazing content try to be as honest and open as possible and try to share this science in a way that people get. 
So the formula is just a faster way for me to get to my intention. So if you have good intention, it's very authentic. In fact, it's sort of in a weird way. I think a lot of the times really brilliant inventors or really technical entrepreneurs or uh, brilliant graphic designers or computer programmers, a lot of the times it's inauthentic when they feel like they have to make chit chat that isn't comfortable for them when all they want to do is dive into their ideas. I would rather them use the formula to get through that first impression so they can get right to the meat of the, the heart of their ideas. Do That's you, my definition of authentic. I, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you said that. that. That really made me rethink that quickly. So I appreciate that. When you are, now that we're kind of getting back out there um, and there are, they're not like networking events, but you know, where you go and you meet people and you see them in person, are those situations you enjoy? Do you like those? Do you like meeting new people at events where maybe they don't know you? I mean, for the ones who already know you, it's a little easier, I know. But for, for the ones who don't, like, do you like those situations? So now I have begun to like them because uh, I am being really forthright with my intention. Again, I, that's my definition of authenticity is like you show up and you're like, here's my intention. I'm going to say it. So I'll give you an example. So, you know, we've kind of been alone for two years and um, I was invited to this kind of muckety muck um, event a couple of weeks ago. And this was right after I started to like go out into the world. And it was a lot of big names. And it's uh, this um, program they're called Beyond Labels, which is basically dinners with really important people talking about interesting issues. And I don't consider myself an important person. So I was sort of surprised to get the invite, but I was like, okay, sure. You know, maybe, maybe they're looking for YouTubers. I don't know. So, um, <laughs> so I show up and I am nervous. I am very nervous. I am worried about having been out in a while. I'm also just like, I know I'm in a room with very, very smart people in Austin. And so I get there and the very first thing they have us do is stand in a big circle. There's about 25 of us and introduce ourselves. And I am not joking. The, the center starts and like, here are the introductions before me. I'm curing cancer. I developed an AI technology that will save the planet. I am fixing climate change. I am a, a billionaire. I, like, like it was like that. Okay. And it's like coming to me and I'm just like, Ooh, <laughs> right. And so I decide to be as open as possible. And I say, my name is Vanessa and I'm a recovering awkward person. And the whole room laughs, right? Which is great. There's sort of like this release of pressure. Yeah. And I'm like, I write books about communication for really smart, awkward people. If you're an awkward person and you would like a conversational break, come chat with me. I have great conversation starters at the ready. And first of all, I felt very, my, my nerves went away, right? Like I, my nerves immediately went away and, um, you know, warmth and competence is interesting because warmth is also vulnerability. So warmth is sharing truth is being vulnerable. Um, that is a facet of warmth and competence is being directive. So I was able to create what I think is an authentic, warm and competent instruction, which is a little bit of vulnerability. And if you are an awkward person, come and talk to me. I have conversation starters that are going to help us. And it was incredible because the rest of the event was a delight. It was so fun. Every awkward person in the room came over. We were laughing. We were being awkward together. I pulled flashcards out of my purse because that was okay. Because I had stated that I was going to do that. And I had people pick, you know, pick a card, any card, don't show me. Like I had them pick a conversation starter and we did them. And it was like all the awkward people. We found our little corner of the room and I made great friends who I've seen many times since that dinner. And so I share that story because I think we, when we think about people with an it factor, we think they have to be perfect, right? We think they have to have the perfect introduction. That's super impressive, but also funny. You know, they have to say, I'm a billionaire and I'm solving climate change and I have five degrees and I'm changing the world. And actually no, everyone was super intimidated by those people. Yeah. And so it's not, I think it being charismatic is not about being perfect. It's actually about figuring out your authentic warmth and competence, whatever that means to you. And in the book, my whole goal is trying to guide you through 96 cues that are options for you. When I was most awkward, I felt like I had no options. I felt like I didn't know what to say at the start of a video call. I didn't know how to open an email. I didn't know how to write emails that got opened. And so there are 96 different cues 
you choose the ones that work for you. It's like a recipe, right? No way are you going to use all 96. In fact, I think now that uh, so many people have been reading it, the I think most people have like 30 or 40 they use regularly. They have like 20 they're trying on and they kind of are excited about. And the rest are like, not for me. Great. Like then you get to make your own charisma recipe. That warmth part is so big and there's almost nothing better than when you tell a bit of a joke and get a good, good pop from the crowd. I mean, how good does oh, that yeah. feel? Like, you're like oh. You know, when like giving a speech and if they laugh at a part where even if you don't mean it to be funny, it's like, oh my gosh, I am rolling now. I mean, it's such a good feeling when you get a good pop from the crowd, especially if you're not a stand up comedian and all of a sudden you get like a laugh like one. It's the so best, good. isn't it? <laughs> so good. I mean, totally transparently. So I know that humor, so vulnerability is an aspect of warmth. Humor is also an aspect of warmth, right? Like anytime someone's laughing, that's a, that's a warm moment, especially if you're laughing together. Mutual laughing is a great, um, oh, yeah. one of the fastest ways, right? Like mutual laughter, the best ways to bond. Knowing this, I teach about science, right? Like my brand is called Science of People. It's a super high competent brand. And so I hired comedians and I've hired many comedians over the course of my career to say, can you help me warm this up? Can really? you help Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Because I could not add stories are warm as well. Um, I, I had a couple stories in there. I had a couple of vulnerability moments, but it was still too competent, right? If I have a 60 minute keynote and everyone should think of their presentations as warm and competent in my slides, I count the number of competent slides I have. And I count the number of warm slides I have. And I try to make them to be an exact match, unless I know I'm speaking to a group of engineers engineers typically lean a little higher in competence. So I will add more, I can, I, I can get away with more competent slides. Um, or if I'm speaking to a casual group, I will add more warmth slides and remove some of the competent slides. Not because that's a group that isn't competent, just because I'm trying to speak their language. Like it's a respect that I know that they will appreciate. So hiring comedians, we literally measure this. I sent my keynote and I, we counted the number of laugh moments, like literally counted. Like there was a laugh, there was a laugh. And I said, I want to triple them. Mm. Like I, I want to triple them. And so I worked with comedy coaches to help me get more laughs, not because I need to be seen as funny, although it's great to get that laugh, because I know that if I add a laughter moment right before I deliver an impactful message, people are more likely to believe the impactful message. The research literally shows this competence without warmth leaves us feeling suspicious. So if I can get someone open mouth laughing, I know that whatever behavior change I'm trying to inspire is more likely to stick in the next five minutes. So good. Okay. Chapter three is called the body language of leaders. I immediately jumped to that chapter. Oh. Uh, I, 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 by the way, I want to hit the first intro too, because you talk about shark tank, which is a show yeah. I watch almost every episode. So we're going to hit shark tank. So I'll tease up for a second, but we're going to hold that. Uh, but know that we'll come back to the shark tank story of the, the guy who created ring amazing uh, story. So anyway, uh, I'm going to mispronounce his name, probably Kofi Essel, Essel, is that, how do you say it? Dr. Essel, Dr. Kofi Essel. Dr. Essel. Kofi Essel. Okay. So you've, you met him, you're both studying, um, at Emory and, uh, he talked about how he connects with people as that he's becoming, um, like they're, they're a new patient of his specifically with kids and with parents in the room. Um, can you share, this is part of the body language of leaders. I mean, this, this podcast is packed full of leaders who are listening, uh, how he does this so well to connect with his first time patients. Okay. So there's a reason I picked Dr. Essel. He's a doctor and this is important. So I competence. Yeah. Yes. I picked a doctor because when we think about picking a doctor, we think about competence, right? Where we think about someone who went to a good medical school, who did well on their tests, who knows their stuff. We often don't think as much about warmth, yet research has proven that even doctors who we say, I only care about a smart doctor, <laughs> we may, may give verbal. No, actually their warmth is just important. So Dr. Essel, who's off the charts and smarts, he had to create a nonverbal protocol for warmth because he knew and he knows that as soon as the kind of you know the if he's examining a patient that's very high competence and it's very intimate so he has a step by step process he's developed for himself starting in the waiting room getting them all the way into his office to try to 
create warm moments before they get into whatever they're going to say, because he found that if he was able to create warmth moments peppered with competence, they were more likely to take his recommendations. They were more likely to actually take the medication he wants them to take. They were more actually to take care of their health in the way that he was hoping them, hoping they would do it. So for example, a couple of things he does that are uh, n- not intuitive that we may- might do accidentally, but are extremely purposeful. One is he very purposefully engages in what's called fronting. So fronting is when we angle our toes, torso, and head toward the person we're speaking with. This is the one benefit of video calls actually is typically we are in fronting position, right? Like we're aligned right now, even though we're not in the same room, our toes and our legs and our torso and our head are on the same angle. One of the worst things that I see a a little mistake, by the way, for video calls is I'll see people who have the camera over here. So they'll, have you noticed that where the camera will be here and they'll be like typing over here and then they'll be like, "Uh uh uh-huh. And they'll look over their shoulder. So one is even on video call, this matters, but what Dr. Essel will do is from the moment they enter the room, he angles his own body. He swivels his stool. He angles his own body to always be in alignment with the person he's speaking with. So when that's the child, so he has, he's a a pediatrician. So with, with his child, he's angling towards the child. And this is really crucial for building trust with children because children are often ignored, right? They're often sort of you know, they look, someone looks down upon them and says, you know, what do you think? Okay, good. But we very rarely will turn our entire body towards a child. And then when each parent is speaking, he angles his entire body towards them. That is a very subtle way of showing respect. It's also a, an important part of our, our helping our brain to bond. Why? Our brain likes to see as much of the other person's body as possible. When we are physically angled towards each other, it's our brain's way of saying, oh, we're physically aligned. I guess we better emotionally align. It's also triggers a whole loop with mirroring, right? Like copying each other, respecting each other, making better eye contact, seeing facial expression. So it creates a loop. So first he, he fronts almost the entire time. He even does this while he's taking notes on his computer. So he's literally trying to take notes on his computer. What he will do is he will put the computer off to the side and he'll type off to the side, but keep his entire body angled towards the patient. He said that he has noticed that is makes a fundamental difference in the amount of time that patients talk to him. So they are more likely to dig deep and tell them things he needs to know if he's actually angled towards them. So fronting is something he does. He also, um, uh, there's a lot of what I call nonverbal bridges. So nonverbal bridges are these moments, these cues that we do to slowly warm up someone from a warmth perspective. So in a, do- in, a, in a doctor setting, he's about to touch a patient, right? He's about to like feel their heartbeat and, and, you know, feel their chest and feel behind their ears. That's very intimate. Going from six feet away all the way to an exam is a lot. And this also happens in person where you might be caught talking to someone across a coffee table or boardroom table, and then you never really quite feel like you connect. It's actually a, a, it's a proxemics issue. So you're not getting close enough. So what Dr. Essel will do is he'll lean in when he wants to really emphasize something, which immediately closes the amount of space between him and the other person. And the prefrontal cortex also activates. So a lean is one of the fastest ways. So if you want to try this wherever you are listening right now, sitting or standing, just lean in a couple inches. When you do that, it actually activates a specific part of your brain that's motivational, that's action oriented. The reason for this is because our senses to smell it better, hear it better, taste it better, touch it more, you have to lean in. It's like a pre-activation um, mode. And so when we even lean in, lean in interaction, it helps activate that part of our brain that wants to take action. It closes the spatial distance and also signifies I'm super into you. Like I want to take action. So all those little things, you know, I, if you're a golfer, if anyone's a golfer, you know, these cues are small, but they make a massive impact on your game. Just like changing micro adjustments in your swing. It's the same exact thing with cues. Uh, one small one in an office setting that uh, I remember doing, uh, I still do this when having a one-on-one with uh, someone, let's say that they work for you, if you're a manager and normally you're sitting behind your desk and you got your monitors here and the person's kind of sitting over here, right. And you kind of angle towards them. 
I actually would take the chair and move it to the side of the desk. Mm -hmm. And that way there is no barrier between me and the other person. And there's no screens. There's, it's just me and them. And we're talking now I have a notebook and a pen. So I, you could see as I've been taking notes the whole time you're talking, I like to take notes, but other than that, there are no barriers. There's no desk in between us. It is showing them. I am 100% focused on you for our time, right? Good, good verbal, like non, non, uh, uh, non-verbal cues, all of that. I think is a big part of it, but that, that little simple thing, cause I would actually wait till they come in, they'd sit down. And then while I'm still sitting in the chair, cause it's obviously on wheels, it moves around to the side of the desk and they see it. They, you know, they, they maybe even subconsciously like, Oh, okay. And that, and that's how, and then the meeting starts. And I think those little things can make a really big difference because I've, I've had a manager before, Vanessa, I don't know if you had one like this. They had a TV in their office. They would sit behind their desk. The TV would be on behind me, behind me. And this is what they would be doing uh, when we talk. I'd talk and let's say I was talking for more than 15 seconds. So I guess I was boring them. They'd go like this. Oh. And I'm like, are you serious, dude? Are you really watching TV during our one-on-one? I'm here for like 30 minutes every other week. So I think like little things like that, like, and this guy was a smart guy, smart guy. I'm not going to say he wasn't. So just, these are things to think about. I don't know if if you have any stories. from. I have a little tip on this. That's like outrageous, by the way, like absolutely outrageous. So please do not have a TV behind you in your office. Okay. That's tip number one. But tip number two is. If you have someone who's overhead gazing you, so that's actually a very common issue um, that you might be in an office and someone's looking behind you at a television or you're in a a restaurant and people are seeing who else is in the room. You're at an office party or networking event. People are scoping out who's better to talk to. It's the worst, right? Like, yes. So here's what you can do. So either you can ignore it and be like, this isn't my person because it's very disrespectful. So that's, that's option number one. Option number two is, and this works really well, is look where they're looking every time they do it. Oh. So look, so when they look behind you, like look behind you and be like, is someone there? Oh, sorry. I saw you looking and they do it again. Oh, oh, sorry. I saw you looking. You will train them out of doing it because you're showing them. That's how distracting it is. Friend. When you look <laughs> behind me, I want to look behind too. It's yeah. super distracting. And so you should actually interrupt the flow of your conversation to show them how bad it is. And they either will walk away because they'll want to scope the room cool, go get a drink or they will stop doing it, which is great. I also want to mention, you know, we have a lot of leaders who are listening. And so like, let's go a little bit advanced, which is you mentioned going around the table. Brilliant. I want to break this down as a tool that you can keep in your tool belt. Okay. So there are two different ways that we can be intimate with someone. And I don't mean like romantically, I mean, like open connection, open book, sharing, collaborating, building a lot of trust, oxytocin. Oxytocin is a chemical of connection. The first is fronting, facing each other without barriers, right? So ideally you don't have a desk in front of you, but if you do, you're, you're giving eye contact or trying to be um, aligned. The second way is you remove all the barriers and you go into their personal space. This is an alternate. You might have people who prefer this because the one-to-one eye contact is actually too much. Hmm. There are people who prefer, this is why some people love sitting at a bar next to each other, as opposed to sitting at a table facing each other. We have subtle preferences like this. So I know the people in my life, like this is, I have a lot of um, parents of teenagers. My, my daughter is a toddler, so we're not here yet. Thank goodness. But I have parents of teenagers tell me, you know, when I'm sitting in the car next to my child, they tell me everything. The moment I'm facing them, They're like, no, no, too much, too much, too much. So you have two options here for getting someone to open up and connect. One is fronting, angling towards them. But if that's not working, if that's too much for someone, try walking next to each other in step, if you can. Try driving next to each other, sitting next to each other. Try sitting at the bar together next to each other. Um, That is an alternate. Or try scooting your chair over to their side of the desk. I would try this in a couple of different ways because you'd be surprised at w- what level people are, are, have as a preference. I like that. Uh, I just sat at the bar uh, yesterday after my daughter's volleyball game. Afterwards, we go get a meal. We go to a bar, great food at this bar, right? We're not drinking or anything, but we're sitting next to each other. And I, I, I think this is the case for her. We, when we're sitting, we also go on a lot of car rides because there's volleyball tournaments all over the place. Those are hours and hours to get there. 
sitting next to each other, you're kind of looking forward. Sometimes you look over, but for the most part, you're just kind of hanging and, and you can get, get some depth. So I really like that one. I think that could work anywhere. Speaking of zoom calls, since I don't think those are going away, I know the world's no opening up, but they're not going away. What are some tips? And, and I have, I have one that I really think about a lot uh, when it comes to your camera um, and looking into your camera versus looking at you. Like this is actually really mentally taxing on me um, because I'm staring into the camera because for you, I want it to feel like I'm looking at you, but I'm not, I'm actually looking at my camera and yes. that part of it is more important for me that you feel that as well as the audience, when they watch this on YouTube, I'm looking at them or I'm looking at you. I'm yeah. actually not, I don't get to see you that much though, because I only peek down every once in a while. Like I'm peeking down at you now, now I'm <laughs> looking in the camera. So can you share some other tips when it comes to how to best come across authentically you, obviously, but to, to make sure that your, your zoom calls are, are, are good ones. Yeah. So, um, you mentioned something that's correct, correct. You, your, your instinct is right, which is that research has proven. So I, I briefly mentioned oxytocin and I should actually explain it a little bit more. So oxytocin is a very ca complicated chemical in our body, but one of the things that it does, is it helps us feel trust. Yep. They've literally found that when people do nose sprays of oxytocin, like they trust and share and collaborate more in prisoners dilemmas. Wait, you can actually do a nose spray of that. Oh yeah. Really? Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Go ahead. So yeah. So they've actually, um, they have the, they have a way to make oxytocin and oh. there they give it to people in research experiments to see what it will do to them. <laughs> Wow. And, okay. And what they found is that at, at low levels, it this is kind of funny at low levels, it makes people just trust. Like they literally just give, give away stuff in personal levels. The more, the, the more they oxygen they get, the more they're like, I want to help humanity because on it's, it's a, it's the chemical of trust. Now that's a full nose spray at high levels. It actually induces labor. Like that's, huh. that's literally what it does. So it's huh. a very powerful chemical. They're doing lots of research to understand it, but the fastest ways that we socially trigger oxytocin are eye contact, touch, and then mutual moments. And what I mean by mutual moments is when we both laugh together or when we both um, uh, say, oh yeah, me too. Yeah, you, what? No way. I love Ohio, right? Like whatever it is, like whatever that me too moment is, that's also like a, a moment of like, oh wow, camaraderie. Yeah. So that's why it's um, a great tactic. Um, I talk about this a lot in Captivate, not cues, that trying to find three mutual moments in the first few minutes of interaction is really powerful. Um, so like coming loaded with those mutual moments can be very helpful in an interaction because it's just a way that you're triggering that chemical. So in a Zoom call, you are right that we do produce oxytocin through virtual eye contact, but it only happens if someone's looking at the camera. <laughs> Right. So if I'm not looking at the camera, you're not looking at the camera, we don't get oxytocin. So um, that's the good news is, is that when you do look at the camera, you're making eye contact. I like a rig. If you can set it up where I can bounce between the camera and you camera and you, that's what I have right now. So I have like the sh screen is shrunk so that I can bounce pretty easily between your face and the camera so that I'm able to do both. So if you can set up a rig where um, you either minimize your screen or you have a little, I've, I've seen people who have little extra monitors that are right below their camera, just so they can see people's faces. Um, that's a kind of great way to do it. The second thing to think about is the distance between your nose and the camera. Yep. So I always make sure the distance between my nose and my camera is at least 18 inches away. The reason for this is because if I were to do my entire, have you ever seen people zoom calls oh, where they're like 12 inches away? It's like, it's, it's way too, it's like, you're like, whoa, it's, it's, it's the equivalent of uh, digital close talking. If you've ever seen that Seinfeld episode yeah. for close talkers, yeah, right? Write, write about the story in the book. Yeah. Yes, exactly. It's, so it's um, one, it's a very simple, literally take the measurement between your nose and your camera, make sure at least 18 inches away and make sure upon logging in, you're not like, oh, 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 hi. Cause that was your first impression was actually when you were too close. So right. some little, little tips, they really help. I also um, really like if you can do it, uh, some sort of a nonverbal greeting in the first few seconds of the interaction. So that could be a nod. Hey, good morning. It could be a wave, which is my favorite. Oh, nice to see you. It could be a smile. It could also be, of course, a positive verbal engagement, but actually the nonverbal ones are a little bit more powerful than the verbal ones. 
you uh, mentioned one of those three that was touching and you can't do that on zoom, but let's, let's, so I think we covered the video calls. I'm a big proponent of this. Um, mainly my background in sports is because of this. there's a lot of touching and you actually cite research about um, the NBA, I guess, finals, the Dallas Mavericks year, the teams, yes. they actually studied who touched more and the teams that touched more won more. Yes. Can you share more? How do we do this in the business? It's on a, on a basketball team. It's easy. We're always touching. We pick each other up when they take a charge. We pat them on the back, all that stuff. But volleyball, I, I, again, I, getting back to that, tons of, of teammates touching. But how do you do that in the workplace without it being a potential problem? Um, so actually, I have a really easy way to do it. And th that research was so fun to read because they created the touchy feely index. Like that's what these researchers called it, where they just sat and watched games and just counted butt pats, back pats. They cataloged them. Mm -hmm. It's like the funniest research to read. Yeah, the Mavs out touched by a tremendous amount. They were super touchy and, and they they went all the way. So how do we do this in a business setting? So first, you do have um, business okay touches, right? So you can, you know, walk in and give the handshake or, you know, pat someone on the upper shoulder. Good to see you. Good morning. As you're walking out or into a conference room, you could, you know, say, Hey, good morning. Hey, Jill, how are you? And you can, so if that's comfortable for you in your workplace, those casual upper back touches. And of course, handshakes are great. I love handshaking people. I already know. So I will very often like, you know, like, oh, it's so good seeing you. Like I will reach out my hand, even just as a, like, not only the first time, a lot of the times what happens, we forgo the handshake when we already know someone, but actually after you've met with a client many times, it's great to always end it on a handshake. Mm -hmm. So um, handshakes, back pats, I love. The other way you can do this, it's kind of a crazy way, is you can also mention oxytocin words. So there's a whole section in the book on verbal cues and our words are really important, but I think that we don't even use that the right way in the sense of there are warm words and there are competent words. And this is a little bit more art than science, but warm words kind of give you the warm and fuzzies. When I say best, both collaborate together, happy, we, those are kind of warm and fuzzy words. In fact, our brain likes those words. We're like, mm, yeah, together. We're together. We just like that sense. So that's a little bit oxytocin inducing in its sense versus competent words. Competent words are the get it doneers, right? These are uh, productive, brainstorm, efficient, power through, right? Like those yeah. kind of like, oh, it makes you want to do words. And so the way that we can do this in the business in a business setting is we can say, oh, Team, it is so lovely to see you today. We have a wonderful agenda. My goal is for us to collaborate and bond and connect. I can't wait to get started. Now, if I start a meeting like that, I haven't touched anyone, but you kind of are already, we're, we're priming for, ooh, the warm and fuzzies, right? Like I'm being cued and research is quite clear on this. When we hear a word like collaborate, our brain prepares to be collaborative. When we hear a word like power, so what if I were to start the meeting like this? All right, everyone, today is the day. We are going to get it done. We have a long agenda, but I know we're going to be productive and efficient. I have a goal session on the board. We're going to brainstorm it and uh, let's get her done. That's totally different, right? Yeah. Like if I prep for get it done or productivity, our brain gets ready to be productive. And so those words really matter. And that's a, a way that we can replace oxytocin in a sense by just being more purposeful with our words. As long as they're authentic, right? I don't want you to feel like you're going with a fake script. Like I do want you to actually have intention to collaborate, right? Like the yeah. worst would be that you prepare people to collaborate and then you're not actually collaborative. Um, are you seeing hugging making a big comeback? I, I am. I feel like I now guys, girls, it doesn't matter. Uh, sometimes like if it's the first person you meet, the person will say, Hey, I'm kind of a hugger or whatever. And it's a little awkward, but then you hug them. Then you feel like you've gotten closer. And then it's, it's, it's a natural hug. The next time I feel yeah. like for me, at least this is, I had a host of the leadership offsite. Some of the people I'd only seen on zoom for the last eight months, we got together in person for the first time. There was a lot of hugging going on. Yes. What do you think hugging, about that? Hugging is making a comeback what's funny about it. I've also noticed that the long hug is making a comeback. Yeah. So like I was always a hugger, but now I've multiple times I've been hugged over two or three seconds. <laughs> like, like 
people are like committing to the hug. Like they're like, mm, Let's your go. body, yeah. we're just feeling good. About it. And like, I'm okay with it. If you are not a hugger, you should be very clear about that. Right. Yeah. And I, this happened to me just the other day where, so very easy cue here is if someone comes at you with one hand, they are cueing you for a handshake. If they're coming at you with two hands, they're cueing you for a hug, follow yeah. their lead. But yeah. right? I always, I will, I leave my hands down until I see what they want. And that has saved me many an awkward side hug, right? Like you don't want that awkward side hug. <laughs> <laughs> Love we it. Promise okay. shark tank. We have to do shark tank. No, I know. I know. I'm just going to say it. Okay. We tease the shark okay. tank. I know we got a, only a couple minutes to go. Let's, let's tell the, the, the reason why the founder of ring initially screwed it up. All right. So I love Shark Tank. I'm a huge Shark Tank fan. The reason why I like Shark Tank so much is because these are all good ideas, but some of them are like everyone, everyone wants a bite. And some of them people are like, Meh, not really. And so I think that a lot of the times how the idea is delivered is just as important as the actual idea, because they're all pretty good. Like I've, I've talked to insiders on the show and like, they don't know who's going to get a deal. Like all the ideas going in have a chance of getting a deal. I wouldn't just put someone in there who's a disaster. Although occasionally they do put people in there who are disaster, but that's very rare. So all these ideas are good. Why do some get taken? So we did a massive study with my uh, research partner, Jose Pina, where we analyzed 495 shark tank pitches. It took months and months of work coding as many aspects of the pitches as we could looking for patterns. And this is what I talk about in the book is what were the patterns that we found in this research? There was one particular pitch that stood out to me, which is what I opened the book with Jamie Siminoff, founder of ring ring. Okay. This is on millions, if not billions of doorbells around the world. It was eventually acquired by Amazon for over a billion dollars. Shaquille O'Neal and Richard Branson invested in Ring, but it completely failed in the tank. Why? So this pitch just absolutely dumbfounded me because I was like, this idea is an incredible idea. It went on just a few months later to get huge investment. But if you watch the pitch, you will see the verbal answers are pretty good, but his nonverbal and his vocal answers are terrible. And the very first one, the biggest cue that um, hopefully I can teach here that you can just use for the rest of your life is the cue that I think broke Jamie Siminoff is the question inflection. The question inflection is a vocal cue. And it's when we go up at the end of our sentences. So we're talking like this, but we go up at the end. So it sounds like every sentence is a question. We know when researchers found that when we hear the question inflection accidentally used on a statement, our brain goes from listening to scrutinizing. And that is because liars often use the question inflection. So we did a massive lie detection research in our lab, which I talk about in the book where people submitted lies. And we found that, that was the most common tell that in two truths and a lie, people would ask their lie. So it would sound like this, two truths and a lie is three statements. So to see if you can hear what the lie is, two of these are truths, one's a lie. I'm from Los Angeles. I love dogs. I'm a vegetarian. You're not a vegetarian. I'm not a vegetarian. I love dogs in Los Angeles. So that's what we heard over and over again. So Jamie Siminoff, the very first thing he says in the pitch, and it broke him, I think, is he closed the door to the shark tank and he knocked on the door and uh, they said, who's there? And he said, it's Jamie here to pitch. That is basically saying, I'm not confident in my pitch and who I am and why I'm here. So you shouldn't be either. And that, that first impression right then and there, I think it made them doubt him in his entire pitch. They doubted every single thing he said. Now there was hundreds of cues that happened at that pitch and I break down a bunch of them, but I think that that vocal inflection. So a takeaway for listeners is if you have something to say, say it, don't ask it, especially your name. I cannot tell you how often I hear people introduce themselves on their voicemails or at a meeting and they go, hi, I'm Vanessa. Good to see everyone. Mm. So your intros, your voicemails, second, your numbers. So if you are in sales, this is the single biggest mistake I see in sales where people are doing great in their pitch. They're saying it. We'd love to have your business. We'd love to work with you. And the cost of our program is $5,000. 
When you do that, you are begging people to negotiate with you. You're saying, I'm not so sure about this price and neither should you be. And so a uh, thing to think about here is if you're willing to audit yourself, to listen to some previous sales calls that maybe didn't go well, listen for accidental question flexion. I find that is the number one way that we give away all of our power. So good. The book, which is a must read, is called Q's Master the Secret Language of Charismatic Communication, Small Signals, Incredible Impact. It It'll grab you. And it's one of those ones I like to say great authors earn each turn of the page. Vanessa, you absolutely earn each turn. So thank you so much for being here. And as always, I'd love to continue our dialogue as we both progress. Oh my goodness. I'm so grateful to you. I'm so grateful for our listeners. And thank you so much for supporting this work for all the awkward people out there. If you are trying to develop your it factor, I'm so honored to help because it can be learned. So good. Thank you so much, Vanessa. 